Thank you very much, Michelle, for that kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here today at what I consider to be an extremely timely conference. Of course, when I was asked to speak on free speech, international law and Julian Assange, I quickly realised that there are a whole variety of really interesting international law issues that arise from the activities of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. However, as I only have 20 minutes, and as I've seen that Michelle is timing all of these speeches, um, I thought that I would focus today on what I consider to be probably the most um, relevant and contentious of these issues, which is the way that we balance freedom of speech on the one hand, with national security issues and considerations on the other. And to make what is probably a fairly controversial statement at a freedom of speech conference, my ultimate conclusion is that national, national security concerns do indeed sometimes need to restrict freedom of speech and that where we find the balance is the real issue that we need to consider. And in relation to WikiLeaks, my ultimate conclusion that I'm going to be um, discussing today with you and leading you towards is that whilst WikiLeaks on the one hand can be a very powerful tool for strengthening freedom of speech around the world and increasing transparency and accountability. At the same time, some of the materials they've published, while perhaps not being illegal, although I note that's yet to be decided, it certainly has been highly irresponsible, in some cases incredibly immoral, and I would argue in certain instances has actually reduced freedom of speech in the long term and damaged that very important right. Now, to lead you towards my reasoning for this conclusion, I propose to do three things. The first is to give you a background into WikiLeaks and the release um, of the particular documents that I'll focus on. The second is to look at the national security concerns that arise as a result of the release of those documents. And then the third is to highlight a number of issues that WikiLeaks really um, brings to life in terms of how we balance freedom of speech and national security, and in particular, how we do that in the age of both the internet and new media organisations such as WikiLeaks. Of course, the starting point here is that freedom of speech is a very important <coughs> human right. And we can see that through all of the variety of international, regional and domestic treaties, resolutions, declarations, constitutions and court cases that talk about the freedom. What all of these documents do as well, however, is recognise that freedom of speech is not an absolute nor unqualified right. And I was pleased to see Professor Brumer point to Article 10 of the European Convention, and specifically he put up on the screen Article 10, subsection 2, which notes expressly that the interest of national security is recognised as legitimate justification for restricting human rights. And you can see this throughout many of the documents talking about human rights. For example, Article 19, subsection 3, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights specifically says that the protection of national security is a legitimate justification for restricting human rights. The question of course then is well, how do we strike an appropriate balance between these two sometimes conflicting ideas of national security on the one hand and freedom of speech on the other. Now in the case of WikiLeaks, we have an organisation that, within the first 12 months of it, its existence, managed to post some 1.2 million documents onto the internet. It describes itself on its website in the following way. WikiLeaks is a not-for-profit media organisation. Our goal is to bring important news and information to the public. We provide an innovative, secure and anonymous way for sources to leak information to our journalists. One of our most important activities is to publish original source material alongside our news stories so readers and historians alike can see evidence of the truth. Now in terms of what WikiLeaks has actually put up on the internet, there's been a really wide variety of documents that have been leaked. Everything from the collateral murder video, which in 2007 well, showed gun site footage of a 2007 Baghdad airstrike in which Iraqi journalists were killed um, by an American Apache helicopter, through to the standard operating procedures of Camp Delta, the membership list of the British National Party, and the private email account of Sarah Palin. 
So there's been a wide range of information ranging from secret military documents down to personal emails from a vice presidential candidate. In relation to this discussion about freedom of speech and national security, there are four main groups of documents that I'd like you to be aware of and to think about. The first is the Afghan War Diary documents that were published in 2010. This consisted of approximately 75,000 documents that were initially released, and there were about 15,000 documents that WikiLeaks held back um, as part of their, as they termed it, harm minimisation process. And the documents in the Afghan War Diary were documents that outlined really all of the incidents that occurred during that war and gave a whole range of information about troop movements, military strategies, critical incidents and the like. These were followed in 2010 in October by the Iraq War Logs, which was a collection of 391,832 reports that documented the war and occupation of Iraq from 2004 to 2009. And it's been described as the largest leak of classified military um, documents in history. In relation to both of these documents, the Iraq documents and the Afghanistan documents, there were particular concerns about the naming of individuals who'd provided information and support to the US war efforts. In particular, individuals in both Afghanistan and Iraq who'd been undercover collaboratives um, with the coalition efforts. The third group of documents are the diplomatic cables that have been released. And on the 28th of November 2010, WikiLeaks began publishing 251,286 leaked US Embassy cables that dated from 1966 up until 2010. These documents contain, co contain confidential communications from some 274 US embassies around the world to the State Department. And when you look at the topics that were discussed in these cables, the search terms, for example, of terrorists and terrorism appear in some 28,801 documents. Now, although much of the information contained within the documents was perhaps mildly embarrassing, and I note, for example, the comments that were made about our former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, is amongst them, there were documents that did cause particular concern from a national security perspective. For example, there was one February 2009 document entitled Critical Foreign Dependencies Initiatives List, which listed from an American perspective specific facilities whose disruption would harm US interests, which in effect provided a specific list to terrorists of the types of institutions they might like to target. There was also um, the reference in one cable to Zimbabwean Prime Minister Morgan Shangarai and his private support for sanctions against Zimbabwe, which in fact then allowed the Zimbabwean government to explore prosecuting him for treason. So these documents, whilst on the one hand provided much amusement in terms of the personalities they discussed and the private conversations they exposed, there were actually some very serious implications through the information that was contained within these. And of course, because of the volume of documents, WikiLeaks helpfully provides a search engine attached to each of these so that you can search through the documents quite quickly looking for key words to isolate, for example, amongst the Afghan and Iraq war logs, the term informant to find the information that you might be wanting to use. Now, the reactions to WikiLeaks have been both positive and negative. The one thing that all reactions have in common is they're very strong. Nobody has a muted reaction to what WikiLeaks has done. Supporters have commended the organisation for exposing both state and corporate secrets, for increasing transparency and accountability, and in particular for supporting freedom of the press. It's claimed that WikiLeaks was at least somewhat responsible for assisting and um, inflaming, so to speak, the, um, the rise of popular democracy movements in relation to the Arab Spring, and in particular in relation to events in Tunisia. Julian Assange was the reader's choice for Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 2010. He was awarded the 2009 Amnesty International New Media Award and the 2008 Freedom of Expression Award for New Media. On the other side, there has been substantial criticism. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein in America, for example, has called him an agitator intent on damaging our government and has called for him to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. 
Thomas Friedman, an opinion author with the New York Times, declared WikiLeaks one of two major threats to a peaceful world, parallel to the threat posed by an ascendant China. The Australian Prime Minister condemned the release of diplomatic cables by WikiLeaks, with Julia Gillard stating that it was a grossly irresponsible thing to do and an illegal thing to do. And indeed, Julian Assange has now hired lawyers, perhaps ironically for a supporter of freedom of speech, to pursue her for defamation. And during a press conference in December 2010, the US Attorney General Eric Holder stated that the Department of Justice was engaged in a very serious, active and ongoing investigation that is criminal in nature in relation to the WikiLeaks release of information. Now, there is one prosecution that is well underway in relation to WikiLeaks, and that concerns the prosecution of first class, our uh, private first class Bradley Manning, who is the 22-year-old um, military employee who is alleged to have released or leaked the confidential documents to WikiLeaks in relation to the Afghan documents, the Iraqi documents, and many of the diplomatic cables. He was held first in July 2010. He was arraigned in February 2012, and his trial is expected to begin in February 2013. He has an extensive supporter network who claim that he is effectively a political prisoner who is a champion of free speech. Now, in my view, it is very important to draw a distinction between, on the one hand, individuals who leak classified military information, and on the other hand, news organisations, and I'll come to whether WikiLeaks can be classified as that um, a little later, but news organisations that simply release or distribute that information. And certainly from a freedom of speech perspective, I think there is a difference between an individual who illegally accesses and steals classified information and a media outlet who is not involved in the illegal collection of that material, but subsequently releases and distributes that material. The freedom of speech implications are much stronger, I would suggest, in the latter as opposed to the former. There is certainly an ongoing criminal investigation in relation to WikiLeaks, but there are some very serious um, difficulties in terms of finding exactly what it is that they could potentially be charged with. The most common suggestion is that the Espionage Act would be appropriate in relation to certainly Julian Assange. However, if charges were brought under the Espionage Act, it would in fact be the first time in US history that a media organisation or individual who was not involved in the illegal collection of material, but rather in the publication of it, was charged under the Espionage Act. And the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, the First Amendment protections that attach to the publication of that type of information are strong. <coughs> Secondly, the Espionage Act has a specific intent element that means any charges that would be brought against Julian Assange in America under the Espionage Act would need to establish that he in fact intended specifically to harm the US by publishing the classified information, which on the facts of what has been done would be a somewhat difficult thing to establish. The possibility of a criminal prosecution, however, is really a secondary um, consideration. As for the governments involved, the primary consideration seems to be the need to stop this type of information being leaked in the first place. And from our perspective, it's important to consider whether the information should be made available as a matter of freedom of speech, or whether the national security implications are so strong that we're comfortable with those restrictions being applied. So the more important question, I suppose, rather than any subsequent criminal investigation, which in fact assumes the fact that the material is already released and is already in the public domain, so the damage has effectively already been done, is whether in fact we should be able to stop that publication from the outset. And it does appear that there are a number of significant national security implications that do arise from the release of the documents by WikiLeaks. The first and most obvious is that the names of collaborators weren't redacted from the documents. This was a particular problem in relation to the Afghan documents in which no effort was made to redact or remove names. It was also, however, an issue in relation to the Iraq war diaries, where despite WikiLeaks saying that they had um, removed names from a number of documents and withheld other documents, in fact, the Department of Justice quite clearly came out and said there were at least 300 informants whose names were mentioned and who, in fact, were therefore publicly outed by the release of information.
as the um, Department of Justice said at the time, the Taliban has been gifted with a treasure trove of intelligence, identifying hundreds of collaborators with coalition forces, many of whom had taken great pains to disguise their connection to the governing regime and its Western backers. The exact number is unknown because the trove is so far vast that few people, possibly none, have been able to sift through it all. The Taliban, however, have promised that they will. These concerns led, for example, reporters Sans Frontiers to address an open letter to Julian Assange in August 2010, where they said, indiscriminately publishing 92,000 classified reports reflects a real problem of methodology and therefore of credibility. Journalistic work involves the selection of information. WikiLeaks is an information outlet and as such should be subject to the same rules of publishing responsibility as any other media outlet. And Julian Assange himself has acknowledged the fact that WikiLeaks may very well have blood on its hands, as he put it, as a result of these leaks. However, he expressed the view that when you balance up all of the different factors, the potential improvement in transparency and accountability was more important than the innocent lives that may be lost as a result of that. My question would be why it is him that gets to make that decision and whether we feel comfortable about the fact that a private individual is able to release information and effectively make that judgment call. More broadly, beyond the release of specific names, the Pentagon noted at the time that this is all classified secret information never designed to be exposed to the public. Our greatest fear is that it puts our troops in even greater danger than they inherently are on the battlefield, that it will expose tactics, techniques and procedures, how they operate on the battlefield, how they will respond under attack, the capabilities of our equipment, how we cultivate sources and how we work with Afghanis and Iraqis. One other concern in relation to this material is that ultimately it may well result in national security agencies being more secretive and less likely to, for example, share information both within America and internationally. And this is a real danger because one of the problems that, for example, the 9-11 Commission report identified as being a major factor in terms of counter-terrorism capabilities was the lack of coordination across regimes and particularly the lack of coordination prior to 9-11 between security agencies within the United States. In relation to the diplomatic cables, it's probably more difficult to directly quantify what damage has been done in terms of national security. Undoubtedly, the release of the cables was embarrassing. However, this probably isn't enough to restrict freedom of speech. However, more broadly, I think there's a real danger in the release of the cables of a chilling effect in the area of diplomacy at an international level. Because of course, individuals working in the diplomatic arena need to be confident of confidentiality and secrecy so as to enable them to speak freely and frankly. And in that way, the release of this type of information may in fact have the opposite of the intended effect um, attended in effect, rather than enhancing freedom of speech, it may actually chill speech at the diplomatic level, which has significant consequences then for the peaceful resolution of disputes. Now, the interests of national security do appear on occasion, in my view, to demand that freedom of speech be restricted. A significant question is who gets to make this decision? The executive may well be tempted to overstate national security considerations to ensure that any information that might be minutely embarrassing is kept secret and behind closed doors. On the other hand, the media has a natural temptation to understate national security implications because of course they want to publish the information. And the courts who are called on in many cases to adjudicate this type of matter simply have no experience in national security or foreign affairs and don't have access to the same types of information that the executive have when they're having to make national security assessments. And the difficulties of making these types of assessments can be quite clearly seen from looking at the diplomatic cables that were released by WikiLeaks. On the one hand, Hillary Clinton, US Secretary of State, claimed that the release of cables put people's lives in danger and threatened national security. On the other hand, former US Secretary of Defense Robert Gates talking about the same release of information, said, is it embarrassing? Yes. Is it awkward? Yes. 
but the consequences for US foreign policy, I think, are fairly modest. Ultimately, in the United States, the courts have determined that First Amendment rights may be restricted by national security considerations, but that a strict standard of scrutiny needs to be applied to this type of analysis. The court has expressly stated on many occasions, including cases such as in re Washington Post, that it will not blindly accept the government's insistence on the need for scrutiny or the government's claim that national security is at risk and that any such restriction must, must be necessitated by a compelling government interest and narrowly tailored to suit that interest. However, in the recent case of Holder and the Humanitarian Law Project, the United States Supreme Court, in a majority opinion authored by Chief Justice Roberts, acknowledged that the court would ordinarily defer to the government's assessment of the facts as to whether the national security and foreign policy interests of the US would be endangered. So whilst on the one hand the courts say strict scrutiny needs to be applied, they do acknowledge on the other hand that they don't have the skills or the information to really make that assessment and they need to show deference to the executive government's assessment of whether their national security interests are in fact affected. When considering this balance of freedom of speech and national security, and I'll just make a few last points on this before winding up, Michelle, there are a number of issues particular to the internet that we need to consider, and WikiLeaks really highlights some of these factors. The first is that unlike the leaking of material to a traditional news outlet, whether that be print or um, electronic media, on the internet the sheer volume of material that can be disclosed is limited, limitless. And then the capacity for that material to be distributed and searched is far beyond what we've ever seen before. So whereas before the capacity to leak material was limited by how much you could actually sneak out in your briefcase, now you can go in, download something on a USB and walk out with hundreds and thousands of classified documents. So the scope of the risk is a lot higher than it's ever been before. The global reach of the material is another factor that needs to be considered. The material can be distributed at the push of a button instantaneously and reach not just a domestic media market but an international global audience. When we're talking about material that's then being released during a continuing war, the obvious danger of this volume of material being able to fall directly into the hands of your enemy is something that does need to be considered when we're looking at how we balance national security versus freedom of speech. The other issue in relation to the internet is that once the material has been distributed, it simply can't be removed. Because even if it's taken down from, for example, the formal WikiLeaks website, the material has already been downloaded by numerous people and is also still available on mirror sites right around the world. So the actual possibility of courts remedying the release of material that may held, be held to be illegal after the fact, by that stage it's simply too late to prevent that information being released. So in the age of WikiLeaks, leaking has become significantly easier. And whilst the unique nature of the internet opens up enormous possibilities in terms of strengthening freedom of speech and enhancing global democracy, it also opens up enormous possibilities for misuse and significant damage. WikiLeaks, I would submit, is not an organisation that is inherently either good or evil. Rather, it is a tool that can be used in both positive and negative ways. The internet's also changing our perception of exactly what the media is. WikiLeaks claims that it is a media outlet and therefore it should be afforded the same protections that traditional media outlets are afforded and that freedom of the press should be extended to it. On the one hand, this would seem to be an important element of freedom of speech. The fact that something is put up on the internet should be no different and be afforded no less protection than something that's published in a traditional newspaper. On the other hand, there is little editorial discretion or journalistic analysis that's apparent in the releasing of hundreds of thousands of documents onto the internet. Journalists have traditionally been bound by a strong code of journalistic ethics, which recognises that freedom of speech and freedom of the press carries with it significant responsibility. WikiLeaks hasn't pursued targeted whistleblowing, rather it's pursued mass leaking. And I think there does seem to be a distinction between revealing 
key information that details specific governmental or corporate wrongdoing, as opposed to simply dumping a tranche of material on the public without giving any particular thought as to the consequences that might flow from that. One commentator has said that WikiLeaks has bombarded the public with far too much data to easily identify specific cases of wrongdoing, yet enough to put individual civilians at risk by revealing their identity. So in conclusion, what I would say in relation to freedom of speech, international law and Julian Assange is that whilst freedom of speech is important, it carries with it certain important responsibilities. WikiLeaks, to my mind, highlights the balance that needs to be considered between freedom of speech on the one hand and national security on the other. While it has the potential to be a powerful force for good in terms of furthering transparency, accountability and an informed citizenry, on the other hand, the release of confidential military documents and diplomatic cables was, if not illegal, although at the risk of getting sued for defamation, I should say that has not yet been determined. <laughs> I would argue it is certainly highly irresponsible. And certainly in terms of the release of specific names of collaborators, I would argue highly immoral. And in fact, in my view, ultimately it's harmed freedom of speech by encouraging governments to be less open about their security operations, encouraging them to be more protective and perhaps over-classify in an attempt to protect the information that they have, and has also resulted in both um, national security agencies and certainly diplomatic um, agencies in being less open and more secretive about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in an attempt to protect their information from the beginning and avoid the types of leaks that we have seen on WikiLeaks at the moment. So on that note, Thank you for having me here today and um, for listening to the presentation.